Okay, I think we'll start. Uh, welcome to this seminar uh, uh, about the Italian election and the future of Europe. Uh, this seminar is part of our seminar series on Europe, uh, nor uh, entitled Norway Meets Europe, um, and it's a seminar series that is funded by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, the 2018 Italian general election is, as you know, due to be held on March 4. And the outcome of this election uh, is important beyond Italy as it can potentially influence European and international politics. 2017 was a dramatic election year in Europe, but that in the end turned out with governments that support the European integration in both Netherlands, France and Germany. But in spite of this new Euro-optimism, Euroscepticism is still important, an important factor in most countries, and this is also the case in Italy. Italy is also facing many challenges. While we see a certain economic growth and optimism in the rest of Europe, Italy has continu continued to struggle with serious economic challenges, low growth and, and, and high unemployment. And of course, the migration issue is still a challenge. Even though the arrivals have, have dropped with 35%, I think, it's still around 120,000 refugees or migrants arriving last year. And many blame the EU and Eurosceptic parties are on the rise. And with Brexit, the EU cannot really afford more countries that question their commitments to the integration process. So this is why the, the Italian election is so crucial. Here in Norway, we do not know that much about uh, Italian politics. So we are therefore very pleased to have Mr. Lanfranco Fanti here with us today to enlighten us about, uh, on the political landscape in Italy, what is at stake, and also the potential implications for Europe. Fanti is a, a European Union official, policy advisor, and member of the Cabinet of European Commissioner for Environment, Maritime Affairs, and Fisheries. And he has been that since 2014, if I'm right? Yeah. yeah. He's also a historian with expertise on European political parties and head of the Partito Democratico in Belgium. Fanti will start by giving about 30 minutes talk, uh, and then we will give the floor to Elisabetta Casina Wolf, who is Associate Professor at the University of Oslo, and for a brief comment before we open for, for Q&As. So uh, thank you and welcome. Uh, Fanti, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Perila. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to to be here this morning, uh, and I would like to thank very much uh, Nupi for uh, giving me the opportunity to give this lecture, and I, I also would like to thank uh, Elisabetta Cassina for the excellent uh, work on of having organized this, and I'm really delighted also to have him among us, uh, his excellent ambassador um, of Italy in, in Norway. I'm very happy that, that you are here. and. Uh, Welcome and, and thank you for uh, for being here to all of you. Penina gave a very <laughs> very good overview on um, on the topics. Uh, yes, indeed. I would like to start with, uh, let's say, a national angle, and afterwards uh, enlarging a little bit the perspective into the what's going on in Europe. And uh, basically, they, I think it's it's important to analyze together. Um, our national elections, being Italians, being uh, Germany, being Spain, being France, being UK, being Austria, somehow even being Norway, but uh, within the, in the context of the European Union as a political organization, and not only as a geographical dimension, but as an uh, international uh, uh, or political organization, the great interaction and the effort that a single uh, national election, namely in that case, as we're talking about Italy, as, a, as you know, Italy is one of the uh, founding member states of the European Union uh, from 1953, you know, 56, uh, the first treaties, Italy's been very much uh, uh, one of the founding, the, one of the six uh, main founding member states, and the core of the binding process of European Union. Uh, Pernilla was, uh, was uh, said about the skepticism and so on. Uh, just to let you know that uh, the, 
the latest polls, and I will come back after the polls of the, on the elections, but the polls about the, how close we feel Europe, we have moved in 10 years from 65% uh, of people looking at the European Union, I'm talking about Italy, uh, looking at the European Union as a very positive project, uh, something that we, we believe on, uh, something that is, uh, is very uh, positive for Italy, and we move from 65 to 40%. This is an incredible uh, shift, and it's not only it, it, Italy. It's a uh, Euroscepticism, skepticism that is uh, embracing, unfortunately, several member states, and it's a wave that, unfortunately, I say, unfortunately, is uh, as a strong uh, believer of the European Union project as a federalist. I, I, I studied political science in the University of Bologna. I made Erasmus in Copenhagen. I, I wrote my master thesis in Altiero Spinelli project uh, for a new European Union, uh, uh, the project that he, he wrote in, in the European Parliament in 1984. So I do, I do strongly believe on the positive effect of, uh, of Europe. But this positive effect uh, apparently is not very seen, or at least uh, not, not right now, among uh, our uh, citizens and among our uh, member states. Not so much as it should, as it should and not, uh, not so much as it was. Today now we can uh, uh, go through why this is happening and the contribution, and then we go to another subject, of political parties. Our political parties, in a way, are influencing this wave of uh, nationalism, populism, uh, and this anti-Europeism, that it's, um, it's, there's a kind of a line, an international line, uh, I, I see two things. There are structured political parties, which now slowly are growing up. Like, you know, that's the, I'm taking the groups of the, within the European Parliament. The ALDE group, which uh, uh, gathers together the, let's say, the liberal parties of Europe. The Social Democratic Party, which gathers the different social and uh, left wing, more or less, parties in Europe. The PPA, which is the group, the, the biggest group, which um, gathers together the, 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 the center, center right parties, and then there are other groups which, which gather the center right, more nationalist party, and they are they are grouped in this, let's say, European groups. But then there is a, and they are not very much organized, and which is a, a, a pity because they're organized within the European Parliament. But then when you, when you go and I'm sure that you can confirm this. If you go to each member state, being Italy, being France, being UK, being, being Germany, nobody talks about, ah, oh, we are the socialists and we belong to the socialists. No, we are the socialists, and that's it. We are the democratic, and we are in the... Nobody mentioned as the mental uh, perception, the mental, sh the sh still the, the shape of the mind that the, we are European, political parties. No, it's a national political party. And within this national, par national party, the line is going very much into keeping this national angle very much, rather than try to expanding it and to enlarging it towards a, a European dimension, especially, and now we go to the topic of this morning, especially when it comes to national elections, any party being the Partito Democratico that I'm leading in Belgium, being the Movimento Cinque Stelle, being the uh, Forza Italia, being uh, Salvini, they, they keep very much the national dimension. It is something uh, good. It is something uh, you know, that in a way provides afterwards, in, in terms of results, a positive outcome. It's the good tactic. I leave you some other question to you. Maybe I can come back later. But, and then that's also the thing that I, enlarging a little bit the perspective, Macron, I make an example, which is a, a little bit uh, an example, the, the one of the few, let's say, positive examples of clear examples of uh, positive in terms, I don't want to, express any political view, but putting in, in terms of that, in, in a way, he, he, he gave a new wave, in his, uh, being for the age, for the outcome of the election, uh, for the spirit that he, uh, uh, in a way, spread out with this, with, with this victory. Macron 
put Europe right on the middle of this campaign. He said, you know, I want France being big in Europe. I want that Europe plays a big role for France and the other way around. And he used this European argument into the whole <coughs> electoral campaign from a content point of view and from the also a visual point of view. Please help me to find a, new, a newly elected president of the Republic of uh, such a, uh, a nationalist, not no, but chauvinistic, or we can, we can somehow we, we, we make fun of the French or pour leur grandeur or whatever, that he comes out with the European item Lina la gioia di Beethoven. And with the European flags, it's a very, very strong message that he used. Now, turn to Italy. This is something that I can bet it will never happen in Italy. Can I say unfortunately? Yes, I can say unfortunately. But I see very, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult, uh, Position is a difficult situation because the situation in Italy is very um, tough. The, the outcome of the election is very uncertain. I'm here because, as Prina said, I'm a candidate, and uh, I'm turning around, I'm traveling around Europe because you know we have the system in Italy. Let me explain you two minutes of this. That also the Italians abroad are allowed to vote, are allowed to vote by by mails. So we receive from the different con um, embassies and consulates an envelope, and then we vote for their, we have our own uh, constituency. And we vote by mail before. So in a way, we are, re we are already voting. We have, uh, in Belgium, uh, I, I, I talk to my friends and colleagues, we already received the, the envelopes, and we are already voting. In Italy, on the contrary, we vote uh, the 4th of March. Uh, I don't, I don't want to go to into details about the, let, the electoral system. We, the, the parliament has just uh, made a new uh, law which basically uh, helps the shaping of coalitions. It's a mixed uh, dimension, mixed uh, system of uh, uh, proportional and uninominal uh, law. One third of the seats are uninominal and two thirds are proportional. Uh, if you ask me what will be the outcome, I'm not a wizard. I, I, cannot, I cannot tell. I can, I can see that there are uh, three main groups. Let's say three main groups. It's a tripartitic or three systematic uh, system that probably will come out. One is the, the, the current leading uh, party, which is the Partito Democratico. Uh, was the you know current government uh, led by Paolo Gentiloni, and before was from Matteo Renzi. Uh, then there's an, a new the, the, the Movimento Cinque Stelle, <coughs> and then there's the Berlusconi, Salvini, and Meloni, the the, the center right. These three groups are very much, uh, I would say, the big chance to 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 be the first three. It's very tough to say who would be first. We have this law that if you don't reach the 40%, you don't get the majority gift, let's say, in order to allow you, allow you to, 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 to have the, uh, the majority to govern in the Camera and in the Senato. And most likely, but again, Italians are very unpredictable uh, in many things, and especially when it, and when it comes to elections uh, even more. Uh, I don't see most likely that uh, I don't see that, that, that there will be a uh, one single party of women that will reach the 40%. Therefore, therefore, the, uh, according to our cost, uh, Constitution, the President of the Republic will call the, 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 the leader of the party who will get, uh, which will get the, 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 the biggest amount of votes and ask him to try to make a government. Depends. Or it, it will depend a lot on the the rest of the parliament. If we if we get the majority, and then it comes to another big word that I will I will repeat uh, in the next minutes, the coalitions. Because from now on, from now until the fourth of March, of course, each of these three parties 
are running as they are alone, are running, let's say, we are ready to govern, we are, being the case of the Partito Democratico, we are ready to continue our work for Italy, being the case of Movimento 5 Stelle, we are ready to take the power, being the case of Berlusconi, we are ready to take back the power. So, in a way, and nobody talks about the future outcome of a possible coalition. But it's, a, let's say, it's the, as we say in Italy, the segreto di Pulcinella, it's the Pulcinella secret, means, meaning, means that they are already preparing a little bit of what will be afterwards, because, it's, as I said, most likely nobody will reach the 40%, which will allow alone to govern. Therefore, the word coalition is very important. It will be very important to, to define who will be the, the next uh, premier, the, pre the, the next premier, and which party, and with which parties uh, there will be, there will be a, a new government. The word coalition, and now I, I will go a little bit uh, um, up and down from Italy to Europe. The word coalition in Europe, as also Penilla said, um, is now taking a lot of uh, momentum, I would say. Why? Because, uh, you know, we, I'm, talk I'm, I'm, I'm talking to a platea of experts, so you all know that uh, single political parties that don't have any more the strength to lead and to govern alone. Not only alone uh, and within their own uh, political family, but they are very, very often forced to govern <laughs> with other political families that if, until uh, the very last minute before the campaign ended, they were really against each other. Can I make some examples? Of course I can, but I, I will finish with the most uh, outstanding. Spain. In Spain, there's a kind of a minority government with this, led by Leroy. They have this pro problem, this situation, I don't know, say, the situation of, of Catalonia. It's somehow, it's, on the, it's like the, the, the elephant on the room. I mean, it's like, a, and the socialists, in a way, are waiting, f so the opposition party are waiting, and they don't want to give support to Leroy. But at the same time, there are two other parties, Sudadanos and Podemos, that they also have numbers in the, par in the parliament, but they don't want to participate in the government. So in a, it's a minority government, which a big regional, let's say, regional problem that nobody wants to, in a way, take the responsibility to face for political reasons that we can understand or not understand. But this I leave it to, the, to, 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 to each of us who has political views. Uh, England, UK, Theresa May, when, it ran, when, it, when she appointed, she, she called for election, it, it, looked, it looked like uh, the outcome would be very clear, with a big majority being for the conservative. We all know that, uh, again, all, not only the Italians are unpredictable, also the, the situation in Corbyn make an uh, outstanding result and the Labour Party rose. And if it's not for uh, a tiny uh, Scottish uh, and Irish party that in a way keeps the, 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 the Theresa May parties alive, that would be a very difficult situation also in UK. And then I go in Germany. What a turmoil. Or a turmoil in Germany. Again, coalitions. The outcome of the election was more or less, more or less. It's a very, um, uh, being an uh, European official, having seen several things in 15 years, uh, I'm not saying that I, I, I expected that outcome because, you know, uh, the, good, the good thing about German people, among many other good things, is that, you know, they do. They do like stability, and they do search stability. But the outcome of the, of the latest election is not very certain. It's not very stable. They have tried then afterwards, Angela Merkel, to do the Jamaica coalition, which did not come out. And I'm not talking about the rising of the uh, Alliance for Deutschland uh, and, the other, and the other parties, alternative for Deutschland. Um, but, and the liberal, but then, now the, the, the landscape has changed, and with a great 
causing a great turmoil in the social party. Schulz just resigned. There will be a referendum uh, of the social party to whether enter or not enter into the coalition. There's a big turmoil. Now they're still discussing, I read this morning in the newspapers, they're still discussing within the social party, the SPD, who will be, who will take the place, who will replace uh, uh, Schulz. So the, 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 the situation is uh, under the sky, as, as Mao would say, it's very, 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 very confusing. Very confusing. Um, doing, and, and it's, uh, and I'll come to the European uh, aspect. In a moment where the international and the European dimension and European policy do need certainty. We do need certainty to face items that are not possible to be taken and faced at national level, such as migration, environment, climate change, also I, w I also add, uh, you know, employment, uh, mobility, uh, rights, rights, human rights. Then these are items that then not cannot be taken at national level. If I look at Norway, let me open a very very short bracket. You do have the historical, the economical, the resource, uh, and also the political intelligence to, first of all, caring about stability. You're looking at the uh, European Union as a, and not only the European Union, as a, as a global partner. You act with the European Union with no uh, minority complex, but face-to-face. Uh, -face. You have your trade agreement, you being on fishery, being on a, on uh, energy, being on uh, other things. Uh, but you are aware, that you are aware that alone in Norway cannot go anywhere. And I think, I believe that Norway also, Norway needs a, a strong European Union. In terms of, again, because the problem of migration is not something that is not touched, is not discussed, is not a, a problem, an issue that in Norway has its own, has its own effect. Yes, of course. And having an European Union who is able to deal with that helps also Norway, I believe. The point is, if we keep going having this uh, very national and nationalistic approach, which starts already in national campaigns, but unfortunately afterwards it keeps on, and it keeps on especially if certain political parties have the power. Let me say that, and again, I am not uh, I'm not <laughs> making any political announcement, but uh, it's, uh, it's, of it's obvious, it's seeable that in the Visegrad countries, so these parties are very much, uh, let's say, they're rather between walls and bridges, they, w they build walls. Between uh, expanding rights, they're restricting rights. Again, I'm really trying to be diplomatic, but it's, that's how it is. And the, it's, from my point of view, it's a personal point of view, it's a, it's a dangerous wave to follow because it will make the European funding values, being solidarity, being uh, equality, being uh, sharing responsibilities, being human rights, fall. Therefore, we do have a big responsibility. Europe has a big responsibility. And, but to having this responsibility, Europe needs to be strong. And every time I travel around, especially now that I have occasion to have more uh, you know, campaigning, when people say, ah, it's Europe fault, ah, it's Europe, I always ask, could you please define Europe? Who is Europe? What is Europe? Europe is government, governments, member states, and parliament. So it's people and ruling class. There are closed rooms where premiers and ministers gather to take decisions. There are bigger rooms, such as the European Parliament, where elected people try to represent European people. They have, in the, sh in the, 
in the paper equal power, but more often governments stop several decisions that are proposed by the Commission where I work. And I can make some examples to tackle the migration. The European Commission has proposed and is proposing since quite a long time, since the, 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 the very beginning of this uh, migration crisis, a system of redistribution of migrants among member states. Being that if a big amount of these people, these mothers, these children, these men, these people, desperate with uh, no money, having lost everything, rich Italy, rich Spain, rich Malta, rich Greece, big numbers. Is it right that they only Italy, only Malta, only Spain, only Greece take care of them? Is it right that, uh, and being these Mediterranean countries, I know that it's, <laughs> they are really far from here, but I see the images, you see all the images, images and you, you do know what I'm talking about. Is it right that these countries of first arrival, let's say, they have to also bear the responsibility to take, to take care of all the administrative procedure, take care of uh, where to send them, if they're allowed to send them, otherwise they are obliged to keep them in their own country? Is it right or not? No, I, I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not right. And I have to say, one of the things that the, the Italian government has done is to really put this problem in, in the core of the European debate. And there have been some proposals from the Commission, for instance, to create the system of redistribution among all member states. Direction of certain member states, I'm not going to say which ones, has been very strongly, no, no thanks. There have been an agreement in the Council, say, yeah, yeah, we do a commitment, not a binding commitment, unfortunately. But it's been a commitment that all these member states have taken. But then afterwards, not all member states have followed their commitments. Some of them not take even not one single refugee or one single migrant. On the contrary, they put tracks, as you know, they, put, uh, they build walls, uh, fences in, in, in the borders. That's a reaction. These member states, on the same time, because one, the, one of the core words of, of the European Union project, what, which was, which is, it's solidarity. The, the biggest amount of the spending of the European money is for the common agricultural policy and for the structural funds. This money is not given by Franco Fanti, Elisabetta, but our own. They are given by all of us, for, for each member states. They are put in a big, let's say, uh, uh, big funding system, and then given according to the needs, given according to the policies, given according to the and to member states, to member states, to regions, to situation, to industries, to young people, to those who need. So the system is basically based on solidarity. That's the, the real engine that makes European work. If you stop this engine then we're going to travel. And that it cannot only work when it comes to give me the money because I want to build a wall, uh, uh, sorry, a bridge or a highway in Varsavia or uh, in, no. Yes, I can give you the money to, to build the, the, the highway. At the same time, when I ask you to welcome and to help other member states to face an emergency, I think you should take the responsibility to re exchange what has been given to you to give it back. So that's the main system of solidarity from which uh, European uh, Union works. This system is a little bit under, let's say, pressure for this uh, skepticism. 
I mentioned migration, but another topic is environment and climate change and international relations. Is Italy, is Germany, is UK, is France alone, or Austria, or Spain, or Portugal, able to tackle the problem of climate change? If, if, if we all agree that climate change is a problem, eh? because there are some, especially in, on the side of the of the ocean that they don't, they don't think that uh, the, the climate change is a problem. On the contrary, they want to invest again in uh, carbonization and so on. If, you are, if there's any of you are among them that think that I totally respect, but I don't, I personally don't. So I do believe that there's a climate change problem. And that climate change problem, I don't know, <laughs> I is facing no way how the climate has changed in the last 10 years, but uh, is it a national answer to, national, to, to climate change? No. Also because climate change has a, has a great implication of, so on the previous problem, problem, issue, which is migration. One of the reasons why the people from uh, Sudan, Yemen, uh, Nigeria moving is because the, the land is getting very, very dry. And there's the six, six that there is no water. There's no. There's a big water problem, and so they, you are forced to move north. You're forced to move north. Move north. Environment, air, quality of the air. Is there is, is there a national air? Is there an Italian quality of the air, or there's an of the air it circulates? So pollution. We do have to face pollution, energy. If we want to respect the commitment that's been taken in Paris. Do we live in Paris? You, you, know what, you all know what I'm talking about, about Paris, the community in Paris. One of the biggest achievements, I think, in, of, the, of the latest years, one of the biggest com commitment, a concrete commitment to reduce polluters, to save energy, to use green energy. Each member states, being United States, being Italy, being France, being Norway, sign these commitments, and now, no. No, I take it back because I want to completely change the policy. And changing that policy alone, it's a big problem for the international dimension. So these, ta these issues cannot be taken at national level at all. Therefore, we need, I personally believe, a stable system which, and this is my conclusion, um, we, you cannot run political election. You cannot uh, propose and make a reliable propose to lead a country if it miss the European aspect and dimension. And you have to write it down. What I blame to all parties, not on, not I'm not make, picking one specific, and not only in Italy, but in general. We still lack this culture of uh, uh, putting things in the, in the European perspective. Because, uh, of course, each of us, when, it, when you go in, your, uh, in, your, in the room where you vote or, you, or when you receive the, 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 the envelope to vote, you do think about your own beliefs. You do think about your own garden, let's say. You have a, more personal view because the vote is very personal, of course. But in terms of responsibility, each party should have the courage to have a very, and I say, European dimension. That's why I strongly believe, and I really finish, of shaping European political and strengthening European political parties. Next year, there will be the, the European elections, 2019. I do hope that whoever will govern Italy, whoever will govern other countries, will have the strength to, to prepare a campaign which should really be discussed at the European level, with real uh, primarie, as they are called, at the European level. There will be kind of a European party to be mobilized to choose who will be the candidate for run to, to, to run the next uh, commission. I hope there will be really the, unfortunately, it's, it's a pity that the, the European Parliament has not voted for this, but I, I'm a strong believer of the transnational list. In a way, the 73, 72 
members, members of the European Parliament from the UK will be moved to members elected from different member states. So to really allow European parties to make their own campaign and to elect these people at the European level. That will be a concrete sign and a concrete help to shape this uh, European opinione pubblica, public opinion. It's a, it's a little bit Latin. If we miss European uh, public opinion, then we run the risk to, to make this uh, error skepticism growing, and that will be very, very, very bad for the future of, of us and for the future of our children. But anyway, I want to finish in a positive uh, note. I, I think, on the contrary, that, uh, for instance, exchanges and uh, Erasmus Plus, I'm one of the Erasmus generation. Among the young generation and with the technology, with the changes, with the culture, and an initiative like this one of helping and, and sharing knowledge and experience is the best way to shape this European public opinion in order to also strengthen our political parties to tackle these challenges that are definitely not possible to be taken at the national level. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to all the questions and, and so on. Comment, and then we open the floor for questions and answers. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm sorry I have a terrible cold, so uh, I'm, all, I'm also deaf from <laughs> the right ear. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, the invitation to this uh, seminar. Uh, it was quite a long time ago I was at MUPI, so I'm very glad to be here uh, again. Uh, and uh, of course, thank you very much, uh, Lanfranco, for your very interesting speech and inspiring. And thank you for the public for being here uh, with the, such a snow today and a snow day. Uh, I was inspired by your speech and I took some, uh, some notes and I uh, definitely wish to, uh, to stick on the European dimension and what you named the European perspective. Uh, and I, uh, I, I wish to comment what you say on euroscepticism. It is absolutely true that we have, uh, uh, we have a range of uh, euroskeptic parties in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, but I, I, I would like to go maybe deeper in this uh, subject, in this uh, topic, and I would, I, I would like to analyze this com concept on uh, euroscepticism because I, I definitely believe that it, it is twofolded. There is an euroscepticism uh, which is uh, uh, definitely, we can agree, uh, a discourse on exit. We do not want uh, the European uh, more European integration. We want to exit. So, and uh, we have seen the the, the result. Uh, the I would say the dramatic result of this discourse. It is Brexit. But at the same time, I I, I do strongly believe that uh, we have another kind of euroscepticism, uh, which is actually a desperate. Uh, ask for a stronger Euro, a stronger Europe <laughs> and a deeper European integration and a more effective Europe, uh, European Union uh, which can take decisions in, uh, in, a rusk, uh, in, in a quick way and a European Union uh, which can give orders in uh, in, um, in cases as uh, the, uh, the migration crisis, say you, know, you have to, to, to follow the, the agreements and take so, so many migrants. So uh, I would like to discuss more uh, on that. Uh, if uh, euroscepticism is too folded, uh, then we have to take uh, account that there are two kind of euroskeptical aeroskepti uh, uh, parties. Those uh, who work for uh, exit and those who that actually work <laughs> for a stronger 
European Union. And moving to Italy, because Italy is uh, in a way also the protagonist of our uh, discussion today, uh, maybe, maybe parties uh, which are seen uh, as uh, strong or skeptical, maybe they wish actually a stronger European Union and, and then could cooperate well with the mainstream, uh, mainstream uh, parties. Um, Moving forward, but uh, in a way uh, still uh, still referring to this uh, to this topic, uh, <clears throat> I would say I would say that the main concern for European uh, or EU citizens are Im immigration, as you said, counter-terrorist security measures, defense, border protection. We I think we all agree about uh, about that these these are the 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 main issues now for uh, for european citizens uh well let me say that and i of course i would like to to have your opinion on that lanfranco and uh, and from the public i would say i do believe that uh, uh both social democrats and conservatives um agree upon that all these issues are supranational uh, our supranational affairs that require a, a common uh, a common response. So European integration is probably the appropriate response to that, uh, but it's quicker. It's a quicker process uh, in these uh, days because of populist party, because of of the real eurosceptical parties, uh, those for uh, for exit. <clears throat> so it is difficult to make progress in the European progress. But my question to you, to the public, uh, why, if, if social democrats and conservatives do actually agree about the emergencies, about what the issues are, uh, why, why they're not able to build a, a, a proper dialogue, a constru constructive dialogue? Uh, among themselves. So the, the social democrats with the conservatives, why do we see the, uh, these, uh, this opposition between le social democrats and, and conservatives? And uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this game, I see, um, it is my opinion, but of course we can discuss on that. Uh, it, it seems that the social democrats are putting themselves in a position of isolation. And uh, while the, the conservatives, uh, to, in order to govern, because, because I uh, definitely agree that uh, today we need coalitions, no party is able to reach the famous 40% like the Social Democrats in uh, past days in Norway or the Christian Democrats in past days in Italy. These, this is the past, <laughs> it's not possible any longer. So the conservatives in order to govern, why in a situation when the dialogue with the social democrats is difficult, they look to the right, they look, they, they are more and more influenced by uh, the discourse on uh, euroscepticism, or even, even uh, they are moving uh, to a, alliances with not only the populist right, which is not so dangerous after all, but also moving to the radical right, which is uh, give, uh, give us reason to preoccupation. Uh, with the radical right, I mean, uh, <coughs> I mean uh, party uh, which, <coughs> which are not only eurosceptical, but also mm, maybe anti-liberal, anti anti-democratic. So would I to have a, mm -hmm. to discuss about that. And uh, in, in conclusion, I have a, um, uh, a third point. Um, uh, I was reading, a, uh, was reading a, a very interesting article from February 2017 by Peter Kreko, Peter Kreko, uh, <coughs> saying that looking at Brexit, uh, looking at the American election, looking at populism in, in general, uh, 
the, the international liberal democratic order uh, can be considered at risk, con considered at risk. Uh, at, at risk. <clears throat> and someone said, someone uh, said in 2017 that, uh, I'm quoting, the, the struggle in the West now is not left versus right, but liberal democracy versus illiberal democracy. So for this reason, uh, uh, we, we should press for a united center, uh, radical center, left, right front of liberals, social democrats, greens, and conservatives. This then does not mean, of course, that there is a need for overcoming all the ideological, different, ideological differences between democratically committed forces in Europe. Uh, what is most certainly needed, however, is to identify the most important enemies of European integration and peace, and to join forces against them whenever possible. So what is your opinion? Uh, again, referring to what I said about uh, twofolded euroscepticism, uh, uh, referring to the forces, the growing forces of <laughs> the radical right. In your opinion, what, what, what are the most important enemies of European integration and peace based on the values that you so rightly named in your speech, solidarity, and democracy, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you again for your inspiring speech. Thank you so much, Elisabetta. This was a very interesting comment. I will, uh, you can go off again and, and uh, maybe start with uh, uh, Responding to some of, of uh, Elisabetta's comments, uh, I thought it was interesting what, what you mentioned about this twofold euroscepticism. And, uh, and I wonder now there is a change, uh, Europe is changing and trying to kind of also taking how can the EU change in order to tackle this euroscepticism or to be more, um, uh, to also uh, take the concerns by the people serious. Uh, and we talk now about differentiated integration, flexible integration. I mean, this is, has been on the agenda. Macron has very much had this agenda in, in France. He's for a stronger Europe, but he's also for a changing Europe. And has that, is that an issue at all in the uh, Italian election? You said that it was very much a national agenda, uh, but I wonder if, if this has been discussed at all. So maybe you can... Uh, take up on, on uh, Elisabetta's uh, comments and then also uh, say something about this. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Elisabetta. Absolutely share your views and your worries. And uh, let me say something. Lately, spitting, throwing potatoes and tomatoes against Europe make you could most likely gain, make you gain or at least raise your result in, in, in the national elections, or even winning national elections, because in a way it's a very, you talk uh, to the stomach, and unfortunately very often people vote with the stomach rather with it more gen generally, not all, all the time, but I make an example. Nigel Farage, if you remember, the one, one of the leader of the Brexit campaign, after the outcome of the Brexit, of the, of the referendum, you could imagine that somebody like Farage or Johnson or some others would raise a kind of a standoff. No, I, I take, I'll free UK. I mean, thanks to me, you, you, he should have been the, the, the premier. He should have been the, the no? What have we been discovered? We discovered that he lied because he made so many, li many lies. We discovered that they on somehow cheated, but not, not, not illegally. I don't want him to go into, into troubles, but he lies, let's say. He, he made some, th he say things that are not true, 
about the EU, EU policies, about the, the interest of the British farmers, about the interest of uh, uh, British, British savers, and so on. But it got the referendum, then it disappeared. I come to the white side from him, from him, because you make a very interesting thing about you know the two big parties, socialist and the PPA. Let's say, let me gather together in the social democratic and the PPA. Why? Because in the European Parliament, what you mention already exists. This coalition, this habit of when you have a proposal from being coming from the Commission, coming from the own initiative of the Parliament, and it's been the, and this proposal, and we I, I merge the different things. Being the drinking water directive, being the cleaner project, being the proposal for the distribution of migrants, uh, being the protection of consumers in terms of uh, food, whatever comes, it's voted by the European Parliament, 751 members coming from 27 member states, separated by political groups. But very often, the three main groups, or even the four main groups, very often, not all the time, do vote together. Otherwise, the laws will not, cannot pass. That's, in a way, the European democracy. Why we are not able to transfer this principle of European democracy into national democracy. Why can nobody instruct our national parties to more or less do the same? Of course, we do have our clashes internally. I'm not uh, denying this. Between uh, somebody from the Partito Democratico and somebody from Forza Italia, there's a big difference. But when again, when it comes to defining quotas or deciding what's the most secure way to tackle the problem of migrants, or to tackle what happened in Macerata. Because again, is this, you know, we have, uh, and, and I, I merge these things. We have in Italy, especially, this big uh, fundamental principle. It's not a law, but it's a principle the anti fascism. We have the fascism and so on. It's one of the most ra radical written in our constituency. Not very clear, but anyway, it's a main principle. Can we adopt, and in a way it's a provocation, a kind of a bicel cool Europeism, kind of a solemn engagement each political party take? In a way, you split who, is, who signed this commitment for Europe, who doesn't sign it. In a way, it could be a, good, a, kind, of, a kind of a good vision to see who is pro Euro and not pro Euro. And in a way, it could help also to more clearly define, because when it comes to I'm against, I'm, there are some parties that say, I'm against the euro. Then after two weeks, no, I, I made a mistake. I'm, 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 not, I'm for the euro. I want a referendum for the euro. No, I made a mistake. I don't want a referendum for the euro. Because you see, and again, not only in Italy, in other countries, when you, it's very easy to split, but when you are in the power, and when you are invited in Brussels to discuss and share, and share with 26 ministers, your own problem of security, and you have to sit to, 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 to make 26 ministers, and you have to discuss this. You are forced to do this. In a way, when you are in power, you become a member or a part of this mechanism. You cannot escape. You cannot go out from that mechanism, because it's already settled. It's there, Europe. And I come to, the, to, to, to your, uh, your good question. But the point is, as it is, it's not very well communicated in Europe. That's the main problem. And then I'm talking about, you know, as a being an European official. We talk too much about systems of decision. We talk too much about what divides us. We don't talk too much on, instead, what we do for citizens. We don't talk much, again, why we don't talk about, you know, the quality of our waters, of the European waters, is the best in the world. Thanks of the kind of a check control at the European level. The quality of our food, how much food and, and the quality of our, of our soil polluted, it's much less polluted thanks to the environmental policy that is established at the European level. We should, in a way, reform, you know, Europe was started as a peace process after the Second World War. And peace was the main message. 
Of course, speech is very important. But now I think we should remodernize a little bit the, pro the, 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 pro the message. And it's not, peace is not taken for granted at all. But we should talk about jobs. We should talk about culture, European culture, European jobs, mobility. Recognize the fact that if a, a newly graduated uh, young person from France could easily be transferred and find a job and recognize the job equally in Poland on the other way around with the same rights. We should recognize that you know the, uh, the, the industry that gains and makes money in a country pays the taxes of in that country and not other, in other countries where they don't pay taxes or they pay very low taxes. This is something that should be imposed. We should propose the abolition of unanimity. There are two policies, two main policies, the one on fiscal policy and social policy that are still decided in, at unanimity. It should be removed. I go to Macron. I finish. In a way to reshape a new manifesto, you're right. You should you know, propose, have the courage to propose giving more finance resources to the European Union. And that's why he proposed a Minister of Economy at the European level and for the Eurozone, who is able for the Eurozone to distribute the resources according to the needs. I think it's a good idea. The transnational list is not only a Macron idea, actually it was one of the, Sandro Gozzi, one of the ministers uh, under secretary of uh, um, European Affairs, Italian, the one who first came with this proposal of the, for the transnational list, as I said before, so I don't repeat, that's another, another proposal. These are the, are the new fundamenta for the, for, to get Europe closer. I am waiting for another one. Thank you so much. Um, I will open the floor for a question. But before we do that, I will just inform you. I mean, the speaker was <laughs> informed that, uh, that this uh, seminar is streamed. But I have to say that for you as well before you take the floor. So please behave. <laughs> uh, I, have one <laughs> I have one person on my list, uh, Richard, from you can start. And then the please just sign up. Hello, my name is Richard Scarborough. I'm from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Two questions. Uh, one first to perhaps betray my ignorance, so please bear with me. But uh, you mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Fanti, that uh, the President Mattarella, he will call upon the party who receives the largest number of votes to uh, form a government. But is it is he obliged to call upon the party who receives the largest number of votes? Or is it the coalition who receives the largest number of votes? Or is it the party or the coalition who receives the largest number of representatives in the parliament? So, again, my ignorance uh, on the Italian constitution. Um, and then, uh, well, thank you very much for uh, telling us uh, a lot about the Italian situation. And I would like to ask one more, perhaps, slightly personal opinion on your behalf. The Movimento Cinque Stelle has, uh, of course, not been willing to ally itself with any other party so far. But if Luigi Di Maio, its uh, prime minister uh, candidate and uh, perhaps also party owner, uh, Beppe Grillo would have to agree, if they were wanting to set up a coalition with somebody do you believe that the Partito Democratico should uh, accept this proposal? Thank you. Likely I drink. Uh, well, um, I, I try to push the, uh, a little bit the speech on the European aspect, and I'm glad that, you know, <laughs> I neglected a little bit the Italian part, but I, th <coughs> I, I see that the, the, there is still uh, interest on that. Um, the President of the Republic Mattarella uh, will uh, um, invite to the Quirinale the leader of the first group uh, which will be shaped in the Camera and Senato. Uh, as I said before, you know, there's a, now the electoral law is a mix between uh, uninominal and proportional. The biggest part is, is proportional. Therefore, you will have a clear, let's say, there will be three parties, I'm imagining it, eh? it's not uh, 25, 26, 27, and then other parties, this is a, uh, a threshold of 6%. The party which <laughs> not reached the 6% cannot be represented at the, at the, 
of the Parliament. Therefore, those parties who are part of the coalition will be in the, in the, in the, in the chamber, will be part of it, but then they, they have to enter into a group. Mattarella will invite the leader of the group. It already happened in 2013 that he invited Pierluigi Bersani because he was the leader of the group who got the majority of the votes. Do, did we have a Bersani government? No, we didn't, because he managed, he tried, streamlined, then he got basically <laughs> kicked out, and uh, Letta came, and you know, you, you know the, all, the, all the story. Uh, I, I, in this I combine with, this, with your second question. Well, I'm not a member of the Cinque Stelle, but uh, if the Cinque Stelle, and Luigi Di Maio and the Cinque Stelle will be the, the first group, I don't know whether or not we'll be able to, 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 to run a government alone. I link with what we said before, you know. Cinque Stelle has a very waving position in many issues, many, many issues. Uh, it's a default, but it's also a quality, I would say, because in a way you could sell your message to the right and to the left. They have, uh, you know, the very uh, wide uh, uh, perspective, because somehow they are against the migration, but uh, they're not, uh, they're not, they, they don't want to be defined uh, being right. Uh, on Europe, I don't know which is the position. I have to say, I know some of the MEPs, MEPs of Cinque Stelle, they do, they do work, they do work. But if you listen to them, the Cinque Stelle elected the European Parliament and the Cinque Stelle in, 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 in Italy, they don't look like the same party at all. They don't vote the same things. So it's a, it's a very, it's a very, it's very, very schizophrenic approach. But in a way, again, again, it's a quality because when if you if they're men, they can talk to the, 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 the liberi uguali or go to the to, to to Berlusconi or even more in Mantova. I'm telling you, this is a very in Mantova. The council in Mantova, the, the town council in Manta, Mantova, votes to remove the. Um, on, uh, honorary citizenship to Benito Mussolini to remove it, and of course, who voted for was the PD, was the Catholics, was the left, and it passed to be removed. Cinque Stelle vote with Casa Pound, which are the Nazis, the Salvini, and Forza Italia. But they declare they're, not, they're very, very anti-fascist. So in a way, it's very. I, I'm for the Cinque Stelle. I cannot make provisions because. They're very unpredictable. I think that, they, and I, to answer your question, I don't think that Parti Democratic will accept to, to, to run the government with Cinque Stelle, not at all. But it's my personal point. I mean, I, I'm talking as a, as a leader of the PD in Belgium. No, I don't think so. Thank you. And then Caroline, do you have a question? I don't have any more on my list, so please sign up if you have uh, questions. I'm a Dutch journalist. Um, I want to come back to the to the disillusion that you sketched out in the beginning of many Italians with 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 Europe, and I was always told that uh, Italians, maybe more than any other Europeans, they put a lot of hope in you know in uh, in the EU being able to change Italian politics, so they would use Europe as a tool to clean up politics in Italy itself. And that one of the reasons that they're now uh, very disillusioned is that they see that they have not, that it has not worked that way. Can you comment on this? Is this a, an important factor? Uh, and second, I have a European question, if I may. And it's about uh, something you also um, you also touched on, which is these pan-European lists. So the, the Parliament, the European Parliament has voted down, uh, you know, even however small uh, pan-European list. But apparently Macron is working. Uh, he has assembled a, gr uh, a group of uh, MEPs from all kinds of countries 
um, apparently there's similar, all kinds of initiatives going on. What do you make of that? Thanks. How? Do you think they will manage? Ah. Do you think, because some people are very, uh, are telling me that, oh, it will never work, and you know, it has never worked, so it won't work. But others are more hopeful, so I would like to know wh how you see that. I, I, will, will you have a chance? Thank you, very good questions. Uh, the first one. Yes, indeed, <coughs> the perception of Italian citizens towards Europe, not only that it's changed. Let me go back to what I said at the very beginning. What people think, and what people think that Europe is, you is a, I, Brussels fault, is Europe, 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 Europe. Europe is governments and, par and parliaments. You know, we all know what happened in the last 10 years, the huge economic crisis we had. How Europe reacted, translate, how Merkel reacted, how Sarkozy reacted, how Blair reacted, how Berlusconi reacted, how, who was the Spanish uh, before Laroy? Uh, the, uh, no, before. Because of the before. Asnar. How Asnar, thank you. How Asnar reacted. Who, who signed the fiscal compact? Who signed the, you know, who proposed it? And who signed, who, these are, you know, the reaction, who forced very much to on uh, Schaubel, talking about another, another, who forced too much on uh, the stability, stability, stability of the accounts, and neglecting a little bit the growth, a little bit too much the growth. Governments, sent, most of them center-right governments. And then, of course, and helping who? Savers or banks? I leave you the questions, I leave you the answer. I think a little bit more the accounts of the banks rather than the savers. Now the, the horizon has been a little bit changed because it's been changed, the, you know, the pressure on that has been changed. Some other governments change a little bit the agenda and put the growth, push a little bit much on the growth on that. But the point is that, you know, we, the communication is missing because when people lose jobs, when people lose futures, future, who do you blame? The first victim is migrants who come in and steal the job. In prospective and in, in, in relative terms, Italy is among, in the in European Union, the country who, who is guessing the, one of the minus, minor amount of, of migrants. In one year, their number of arrivals has been reduced of 30%. But the prospective, if you talk, and you know, I do go out with, on markets, and oh, we are invaded, we are invaded, we are not at all invaded. So markets and Europe. The second, the blame is Europe. And we don't know very much who is the, to be blamed. Then I link it to the, second, to the second answer on transnational list, what I mentioned before. Macron, Gozzi, and so on. It's a very good, it's a very positive proposal. The main role the engine of this proposal should not be a leader. Macron is very charming, he's young, he's cool, he's sad, beaucoup de savoir faire, évidemment. But if you're not supported, and I say it again, by political parties at the European and national level, we support that and explain in the sections, in the small villages, What's the benefit of having an internationalist? You cannot keep it as an elitarian project. You have to explain that these transnationalists are good to represent the people, to, re, to re, re, reshape the European project, and to explain the European project. Otherwise, it will, it, it will never come out, I'm telling you. If it, the good ideas remain only among the leaders, if they're not spread to the people, it's very difficult. No, 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 I, I, not chances. I, I give, I give the, the, the burden, I, I, I call for action political parties to do it. Some of them are already doing it. 
Thank you. We have two, two more questions. I think we take both of them and then you can uh, respond to First here. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Bibiana Piena. I'm a reporter with the Norwegian News Agency. Um, first, thank you for a very interesting speak, speech. Uh, uh, how I would like to go back to Italian politics. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, as far as I know, the, 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 the right coalition, Forza Italia, etc., is, is now in the lead, um, which means that if they win, Berlusconi will get back into Italian politics. Um, I wonder what what will be the consequence of that if, if, the, if the right coalition wins in Italy? Um, what would then happen in your view? Uh, will the PD uh, cooperate with them? Uh, what will happen in the terms of, of the relationship to EU, etc.? Thank you. Oh, good morning. My name is Franz Delamy. I'm an activist, Five Star Movement, and I uh, would like to um, uh, ask. Uh, we all know that corruption and uh, and uh, a conflict of interest and uh, the mafia infiltrated in politics in Italy is a big, one of the absolutely major issues in our uh, country. And uh, and uh, Luigi Di Maio is uh, promising to abolish or change more than 400 laws to uh, prevent to to try to stop this uh, continue uh, um, uh, issue, very important issue. And I want to know how uh, the, the what is the thoughts around for the Partito Democratico around that matter. Thank you. Thank you. No, we're not in Oslo, we're in Rome, apparently. Um, <laughs> OK. The, one, the first week I arrived in Brussels as a young stagiaire, I attended the, the, European, the, the plenary of the European Parliament. And it was during the Italian presidency. And it was the moment where Berlusconi gave the speech uh, to Schulz. I'm telling you, I was a young, very motivated stagiaire again, coming out from uh, Spinelli and so on. Uh, the reaction of the 95% of the colleagues, now they are colleagues, you know, or people, from regardless the party, right, left, center, up, down, uh, something like, you know, un unbelievable. There was a little bit unbelievable. To not mention, uh, all other things that happen for the, from uh, an image point of view, but that policy and politics are not only made of image, though image do count, of course. Uh, I'm not kind of commenting on, on another party because, you know, I'm not a member of Forza Italia. And, uh, <laughs> but if to reply to your question, what will happen? I think the situation has changed. I'm not going to defend uh, the undefendable, but the gravity of the and the, the sense of responsibility I hope it will be it will take over and uh, given all the emergency and the situation not very easy that we are tackling I think that this sense of responsibility will win what scares me more it's not Berlusconi, it's Salvini. Because um, Berlusconi just signed another contract and I think he's a showman. If we want to policy to be a show business, let's vote Berlusconi. I think Italian deserves more. I think Italians are more serious people. And you don't know, you don't need a contract signed in television to, to solve problems. You, you need a contract signed in your job without television. So that, that's the solution. So I don't think it's a showman, but I think we have, we have bigger problems. And if there's a possibility to, let's say, marginalize these problems, let it be. 
these problems are also the mafia. I think that the government, the la we are out from, in 2013, we have the spread of 5.23 between Italy and German bonds. Now, this, we have a GDP very low, we have a huge debit. Now, the Italy is, is coming out of this very dark period. The benefit and the ownership of this positive wave I think, has to be attributed to, to, to the governments, not that, that you know, passed this in these five years. This is, I, I challenge anybody to, to say the contrary because things did not happen falling from the sky. For the policy, from the Jobs Act, uh, from the several, several things, you know, Italy came, came out from the darkness, that's for sure. And also in terms of corruption, which I agree with you, it's a very, it's a very bad problem. But again, I see that, that, except some few cases, mafia is still there, but it's much less. What? Well, it's still unfortunate, but it, uh, you laugh, but it, it's like this. I I I really look forward this that uh, abolishing or proposing and I don't follow the mayor he wants to abolish or propose 400 laws abolish and, abolish and change 400 laws I would like to see which laws I would actually and I, I want to see if they will work if they will work uh, let it be again it's very easy to promise when you have no responsibilities it's very very easy and it's the strength of Cinque Stelle to and always the question, is Rome cleaner? Is Rome safer? Yes. I'm from Rome. I'm telling you it's not. But anyway, sure. You said you were more scared of Salvini. Why? <laughs> I'm allowed to answer. OK. <laughs> but Salvini is the... Salvini and not only Salvini, if I really have to, we, we run the risk, in a way, I'll come back to your question. The, Salvini is a, is a, and, and Di Maio together are the, really the, the ingredients of the, somehow as a, a very good intellectual uh, journalist, Sergio uh, Zavoli said that uh, Di Maio reminded him of uh, Luomo Qualunque. Cinque Stelle, L'Uomo Comunque is a movement that started in Italy right after the Second World War. In fact, the word qualunquismo comes from there. And it was a kind of a post-fascism, because it was not a middle uh, uh, classes movement, saying, as I say, a little, bit, a little bit everything. We are for democracy, but we regret that the monarchy is no longer there. Fashion was not that was not so bad, but in a way we welcome the republic. So we are. I see the qual the, the Cinque Stelle very much like this. In a way, they, they don't have a, a clear position on nothing except on proposing things to solve. So uh, and Salvini. It's a tougher part because Cinque Stelle is very moving. Salvini is no migrants. Police, army, weapons. Let's give weapons to everybody. I mean, this, this, this is dangerous. And again, division. There's people who wants to divide Italy. If we want, if we agree that we have to go to a more united policy, giving p power to these people who want to divide, and even enlarge the, the cleavages that are existing in our society, that's a risk that I'm, I think Italy cannot run. Since we, we are not campaigning here, exactly, <laughs> at exactly. we no. uh, have a seminar um, to enlighten us about the Italian politics. And this is I don't mention good, PD, but I have to, see, I have to I don't mention my party. No, 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 so. I know, I know. This, this has been very good. But I just have to have to give the floor to, to the representative of Cinque Stelle for a very, sh uh, yeah, very, very short, just to keep the balance. Yes, Franz Lamia again. And, uh, uh, well, uh, talking about... Um, uh, the, the lists of candidates of the Partido Democratico, uh, well, 
in Norway, uh, as I uh, understand, uh, when a, a politician is uh, suspected of, uh, uh, of a certain disbehavior and, uh, or uh, there's a conflict of interest and corruption, uh, I think that most parties uh, is taking a very strong position to this and uh, often are, uh, um, how do you say, anmelde in English? Anmelde to politi? Anmelde to Denounce, yeah. Denounce to the, poli to the authorities uh, about the issue uh, uh, of the suspect of corruption or conflict of interest. Uh, in, uh, in the Partito Democratico in Italy has, I don't know, more than 70 on the candidate on the list that are under inquisition, on, under uh, inquired, of uh, conflict of interest, corruption, and uh, many other things. Uh, why are not the Partito Democratico is presenting clean lists such as the Five Star Movement does? Thank you. Very short answer, and then I then I'll. Okay, we are we are very much on into the Italian politics and Italian. Uh, there such list does not uh, you know uh, none of the candidates of the Partito Democratico are have a role any condanna condemnation condemnation exactly condemnation. We are very much for the, you know, uh, we don't propose any people who has a follow any condemnation or cor on corruption or anything else. This, um, this I'm, I'm sure it's, it's like that. I, for my political culture, I don't, uh, unless when you're condemned, because then I, you know, I'm a, I'm a rather justicialist and so, uh, I try to judge policy and politician on what they do and not on what you know uh, once again I, w I want to check the Cinque Stelle or the PD or the Cinque St or the Salvini or whatever on what they do and what they say afterwards I see that in Mantova Cinque Stelle voting that way I take the Mantova Cinque Stelle as the fascist uh, I see Rome is not is more corrupted is more dirty and it's more problem therefore I say the Virginia Raggi is a very bad administrator hmm. I judge this yeah. that's it uh, I'm not judge on, uh, on the uh, uh, hypothetical yeah. things I think we just uh, stopped there but I will I will have a final uh, question just uh, to to move it a bit to, to foreign policy yeah. uh, because uh, uh, of course there has been a tradition in Italy to have quite close relations to Russia uh, and I wonder what will happen I mean most parties seem to be uh, more reluctant to continue the sanctions. So, so what is uh, uh, is the position that you think will? Uh, do you think that that uh, that will be a big issue for Italy to try to uh, to um, to to uh, not to continue the, the sanctions, even though uh, the uh, the uh, criteria for stopping the sanction has not been met? Thank you, Pernilla, because you give me the opportunity to to also tackle another aspect, which is the foreign policy. Thank you very much. Foreign policy is one of the policies, once again, that does not make any sense to tackle at, at national level. Can Italy have a position of sanction against Russia? Of course, can. But the point, we have a high representative, Federica Mogherini, who is an Italian, who is responsible to deal with that. We need unanimity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we need unanimity. And I can give you my personal opinion. In a way, Russia is a, is a stronger, it is very strong, it's a very powerful, it's a very influencing uh, partner especially to tackle the problem and the issue in the in the Middle East and not only of that I think it should be again an European solution to the sanction an European debate within foreign minister, foreign ministers and once again I repeat and I close if you are elected as a foreign money minister let, let's say Salvini is the next European foreign minister for Lia hopefully hopefully it will be, it won't happen he can get the, all the credit of being the most anti-European, the most, but then he has to discuss and share, as you say. With other 27 foreign ministers, the position of Italy, and it's responsible at the European level. So in a way, it's, it's a anti, and I close, it's being anti-Europe, it's an anti-historical position.
in also for the part of European or of the European policy. To answer your question, I think that the, the sanctions should be reviewed, indeed, also for the for the sake of the geopolitical aspect and also for the sake of, of some economical aspects as well. I don't want to go into, go into details because I, I cannot enter into things that refer to my job. A comment? Uh, Elisabetta? To add a couple of points, um, because I heard the questions, and maybe there is a need for clarity. Uh, as long uh, as, long as uh, Forza Italia and Berlusconi are concerned, it is important to underline that Berlusconi cannot come back to, poli to politics because he has been yes. condemned. So the question is, Forza Italia and Forza Italia is a uh, well li liberal conservative party. Is quite it has ch many faces uh, have changed <laughs> since last time they they were in government uh, so we should we should focus on Forza Italia as a party a new ruling class uh, uh, new politicians more than focused on the, on the person of, of uh, Berlusconi who is now only symbolic uh, the, uh, the other thing I would like to could I just ask uh, wouldn't you say that Berlusconi will still have a role kind of pulling the strings still behind uh, will he, he not still have a certain role pulling the strings in a sense uh, without the possibility of being a candidate no no of course he has a role uh, the role of he's keeping together a coalition with very different parties so he has a, a, a very important role at the moment in front of in front of the uh, of the election but uh, uh, c cannot uh, take a political role in after after the the election but of course he is an important uh, figure but uh, the other thing i would uh, i would like to clarify it's uh, it's the fact that we have an article on the in our constitution, the Italian constitution, uh, saying that Italy is a state based on rights <laughs> and uh, uh, no one is guilty before a condemnation. And uh, uh, there is a, a consensus in the Italian uh, system following <laughs> this, uh, this rule. Uh, and, and, and so this can be an explanation why <laughs> uh, Many parties, not only the Democratic parties, uh, have people on their list uh, um, uh, who are under inquiry, but uh, uh, absolutely not condemned yet. And Italy has three degrees, uh, the first, the second, and then the Cassazione. Um, Alta Corte, uh, I, yeah, I don't remember now the name. In, uh, so, and the processes are very long <laughs> as well. It takes a lo uh, lot of time, but again, again, uh, with the reference to a very important article in our constitution, constitution, no one is guilty before a final, a final um, verdict, verdict, and. Yeah, as you say, uh, as you all know, Berlusconi got a final verdict uh, at last, at least for one of the nine or eleven uh, topics uh, he was under inquiry. So that's why he cannot come back to uh, active politics. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we will end there. Thank you both of you for very good presentations, and thank you all for all for coming. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would just uh, add that in two weeks we will have a seminar on Germany. Uh, Professor Michael Keating will come here uh, and talk about the, uh, the political uh, turmoil in, in Germany. So please come back for that event. Thank you.